okay, so we are recording now. No one smack talk anyone else because <laughs> it'll be on record. All right. Um, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. Sebastian, I did make you a co-host. So if any other students show up a little bit late, um, would you please let them in? Of course. Yeah. Thank you. And would you please also take attendance um, at maybe at 530, take attendance. Okay, so I'm going to, you guys can see how I cheat for my Zoom meetings. All right, I'm going to start by reading this poem. You guys know this poem. Um, you hear me anytime I'm doing a workshop, winter program, summer program, I like to read this poem because it's really important for us to remember um, that we're in this together, especially at times like this when rhetoric can be really divisive. And so I'm not going to make you guys read it. I'll go ahead and read it to you because Zoom is very different. Um, and it's called In La Quech. Tu eres mi otro yo, you are my other me. Si te hago daño a ti, if I do harm to you, me hago daño a mí mismo, I do harm to myself. Si te amo y respeto, if I love and respect you, me amo y respeto yo, I love and respect myself. So awesome. Um, so the next thing I want to do, I created, I'm probably going to have to just browse through all of my docs right here. So I invited you guys to this uh, document and Mundo, you already found it, it looks like. Um, and Jeffrey, if you're able to get on this document, that's helpful. But if you just want to share some ideas with us, you can do that too, since I'm sharing my screen. Today, what we're going to be talking about are binaries. Um, and we actually had this workshop last night, I didn't plan this out, where we were talking about um, implicit bias, which binaries kind of came up a little bit in that discussion about implicit bias. Um, the reason that we're going to talk about binaries with this class is because there are a lot of things that we take for granted that actually cause us to have implicit bias because it's inherent within the language that we use. Um, and so I want to first I want to first gauge your guys' understanding of what binary terms are. Um, and I actually am going to show you a lecture that I developed for a workshop um, in 2016. So some of the activities are a little bit more geared toward like a trio workshop. But these terms are really, really useful for thinking about the context of the book that we're working with. Lately, binary has had sort of a different connotation when you have a conversation about it in college. And just like the workshop last night, um, thinking about what makes a man and what makes a woman are usually what that conversation entails, like social constructs of what it means to be a man, uh, like being a tough guy, right? Or what it means to be a woman being good and like solving all the problems for everyone and making sure everyone's happy and stuff. Um, and so definitely in college, people want to complicate that. Uh, but I also want to talk a little bit about where that comes from. I'm not going to go too far in depth. I usually, for uh, my college classes, I'll give a really in-depth lecture of where some of these binary terms come from because I get really excited about it. But I want to introduce this to you guys because it is going to become relevant for our conversation about the book that we're doing. So binary terms are terms that exist in a duality. So they exist together. They're kind of inescapably together. So I put a couple of examples on this document um, man and woman, obviously, we talked about that. Those are binary terms. They're opposites. If you're talking about a man, you could easily also be talking about a woman. Up, down, that's another set of binary terms. They're opposites. Usually, they'll take the form of opposites, actually. Um, so what are some other terms that we can think of? And they don't have to be politicized terms. They can be very simple terms like up and down. What are some other opposites that we can think of? And uh, Jeffrey, if you don't have access to the document or if you're not able to type on it, um, if you just say what some of these opposite terms are, I can type them down for you. And that anyone can, can give me some examples. Do we say it or do we type it out? Um, you can say it. I can just type it out. I was going to have everybody work on this together, but I wasn't sure how many people would show up for this session. Does yes and no be binary? Yep. Yes and no. What are some other examples? There are two terms I'm looking for specifically. My favorite song, Michael Jackson's All is Black and White. Yes. Black, white. Obviously, those are considered opposite to us. What are some other terms? Would straight and gay be? We often talk about it that way. 
And actually, we can, we do need to talk about uh, that as we talk about this, because that's a really good example of what I'm going to talk about later. Um, any other examples? We still haven't hit the terms that I'm looking for. Female or male? Yeah, we have those up there as uh, woman and man, but we'll put sex down there too, since we know that uh, gender and sex aren't necessarily the same thing um, in our society. Would right, right and wrong, wrong. Be that also? We're starting to get closer, right and wrong. So one thing that we got really close to what I was looking for, and I was looking for the terms good and bad or good oops and evil oh lily's trying to get in there we go i put evil up because i'm used to typing an a at the end of my name <laughs> hey lily so we're talking about binary terms um i just added a couple to the list they're the ones that i was kind of looking for good and bad and good and evil um, but we also have woman man up down yes no black white straight gay male female right wrong these are all examples of binary terms um, before we move on to the actual lecture do you have any examples yourself of any binary terms um what is binary terms so they're kind of terms that work together. Um, you don't really think about one without real thinking about the other, or maybe indirectly referring to the other. So if you talk about up, you know the opposite of up is down. A lot of the times they're opposites. And so um, we just came up with good and bad, good and evil, um, which I'll distinguish between the two during this conversation. But what are some others that you can possibly think of? Couldn't tell you, man. All right. Well, let me give you guys two more examples since it's relevant. What about Republican and Democrat? And this one's a big one, us and them, right? So let's go ahead and just remember those terms are there. You have access to this document. And remember that binary terms exist in a dichotomy, which means that they're opposites of one another um, and they kind of fight against one another. Another one that you might hear in college a lot, and I'll put it down here, it's not relevant to this conversation, but you might hear Apollo and Dionysus who are both Greek gods. Apollo was the god of light and reason and lyric and lyrical music. And Dionysus is the god of chaos, the god of wine, the god of losing yourself and going crazy. Um, and so often you'll hear about those two in dichotomy as well. So let's talk about binaries and let's talk about what type of an implication it has to use binary language. Um, it seems like it's perfectly harmless to use binary language, right? Using up doesn't really affect down, right? Um, but let's think about this and let's complicate this a little bit and actually think what does our language do when we use binary terms? So we already kind of slightly defined a binary language and we have access to that document um, at any point. So you can always refer back to it, but it's language or vocabulary that, it dis that exists in a duality, usually as a dichotomy. And we have a bunch of different examples there. We have up, down, boy, girl. And actually I forgot about this one, positive and negative. And those are gonna be really relevant to this conversation too. So, what are some examples of good, like a good student? What makes a good student? I mean, she's got an A plus. Um, the opposite of me. Yeah. <laughs> well, what do you I do mean, that I makes you think you're a bad student? I'm rude to my teachers. All right, so if you talk back to your teacher, so if you question authority, you're a good, if you're a bad student, right? So that would be the opposite of good. But what would make a good student? Maybe somebody who doesn't question authority, right? What's another example? She's clearly, she's got an A plus, and so that makes her a good student. Does that matter at Evergreen? <laughs> no, it doesn't. What else makes a good student? Does everything on time. 
does everything on time. So follows time that was invented by a particular culture and actually, um, you know, make sure they, what's the word I'm looking for? Make sure they cater to that time schedule, right? Maybe one more example of a good student. No? Follows the rules. Yeah, follows the rules. I think that's a really good example. Did you have one, Lily? Wait, what? Another example of a good student. No, no they, were they don't skip class. They show up. Yeah, they don't skip class, right? No. So if we're thinking about good students that way, then that means who are the bad students? The students who don't show up to class on time, the students who don't show up to class, the students who don't get A's, right? And actually that can look different to different families. So some families are really happy if you get a B, but other families, if you get a B, that's like failing and you can get punished for that. Um, and so we have to think, if we're thinking about what a good student is, then we're implying what a bad student would be. And actually, I'm gonna tell you as a somebody who's taught college and high school, what people see as good students in college is different than what we see as good students in high school. So a good student in high school shows up to class on time, shows up every single day, gets A's, um, doesn't talk back to their teacher or question authority, right? But when I get students in my class, I love it when they ask, why do we need to do this? Why do we need to know that? They talk back to me. They push back on what I have to say. Um, I don't necessarily think the students who got A's all throughout high school are the best students for me to teach because then they think that everything that they already know is done and they question everything that I have to teach as a result. And it may make them not, I like when they question it, but it, I don't really like when they don't learn from questioning that. And so if you already know everything, then what do you have left to learn? And I've had several students get A's on every essay they ever wrote in high school, and then they come to my class and they can't handle the amount of feedback I give them, which doesn't mean that they're a bad student or a bad writer, um, which actually brings me to the next slide. So what is bad? We were talking about good, and at the same time as talking about good, we were talking about bad. And a good example of that is a lot of people think they're bad writers. A lot of people think that they're bad writers, especially people who don't speak English as a first language. And you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Sebastian, but I think that a lot of people are really insecure about their writing, especially if they're not comfortable in the language, right? So... I can kind of read and write in Spanish, but am I comfortable enough to write an essay in Spanish? Absolutely not. And yet I ask for my students to do that, actually. I'm asking you guys to do that this quarter. Um, and I'm doing that because guess what? Your college professors are also going to ask for that. Um, as your upward bound person, we'll give you some tips on how to, do, how to do that. But just because you don't write in English frequently doesn't mean that you're not a good writer, right? It doesn't mean that you're a bad writer. So here are a couple, here are a couple examples of a good writer and a bad writer, right? Gary is a good writer because he keeps to standards and practices that make his writing valuable to his employers and clear for his audience. But Bob's a bad writer. He doesn't know what makes good writing or he just doesn't care. Bob could use some improvement. Look at how crazy Bob looks. Look at how happy Gary is. Well, we don't actually know Bob's situation. It could be that maybe Bob's an auditory learner. And maybe even though Bob doesn't write an essay very well, maybe Bob knows how to rap better than anybody we know. And doesn't that make him a good writer as well? Poetry, we don't have to like stay to the conventions of like essay standards, right? So we can do our own thing. And actually you'll find that if you listen to a lot of rap writers or a lot of rap artists, that people tell, tell you that they're not respectable writers. I went through a lot of poetry classes at the college level and I went through poetry classes at the graduate level. Not once did I hear anybody speak positively about spoken word poetry, which is a really clever and performative type of poetry. Why? Well, who, who tends to do spoken word? <laughs> it's not white people. So that, that might be why. And we have to start, that's why I like it when my college students question uh, what I have to teach because maybe what I have to teach is based off of my experience as somebody who managed to get A's when I was in school all throughout my, my experience. And so I know how to walk that line really well. 
I know how I don't show up to things on time, but I know how to show up to things on time. But that means that I'm respecting somebody else's time a little bit more than I'm respecting my time. And is that necessarily a good thing? Or does that make me a good student? Because if I'm respecting my own time, maybe I'm working a little bit harder than the other students when I'm running late for class to get X, Y, and Z done for class that the other students get, didn't get done. And maybe they're still considered good students. So I want to complicate that for you guys. Um, college does not does not equate high school. Those are not synonymous. They're very different. And actually high schools were developed um, at public schools on large scale in our country because we always had like the community schoolhouses. Those schools were developed as assimilation programs for Eastern Europeans who immigrated to this country in the mid 19th century. We were trying to make it to where um, it would be easier for them to speak English in our factories and show up on time and do their job easier. And so if you notice to this day, the public school system um, runs like a factory. You have to be places on time. It starts super early. It goes a little bit late and they expect you to work way harder than they expect their teachers to work. In fact, you guys are actually expected to do things after school and stuff and your teachers get to go home. And so um, you, you do work really hard and people don't give you the credit for that. If anything, they tell you you're a bad student when you don't show up on time. And guess what? We all have things happening in our personal lives too, like COVID-19 and like family members losing their jobs and stuff. And that's why I'm trying to be as flexible with you guys as possible about these classes because what makes you a good student doesn't necessarily mean that you're here. It means that you're learning and you're growing. And that's what's important with college. So we talked about bad. Bad writers, you guys talked a lot about bad when we were even talking about good. Um, a bad writer doesn't necessarily exist in my opinion and I, I'm a pretty good writer, right? I'm a skilled writer. I can say things clearly, people understand me. And we'll talk about that too because clearly when I say I'm a good writer, I'm referring to other things. I'm saying I'm a different type of writer than just good. Um, let's take a break. I kind of went on a tangent and let's talk about white, white and black, that dichotomy. Um, so what does white imply to you? Even as an innocent color, it doesn't have to be completely politicized. As you can see from my example, white lie. A white lie is a good lie that it's okay to tell, right? So what are some other examples of white that we see in our culture? Or what does it imply to you? It's like I'm watching a Lily music video. <laughs> so those are some things to think about. It, it can actually be really complicated to draw up some of that imagery. But um, Malcolm X, before he was assassinated and actually before he became a really big civil rights activist, he was in prison, he was in jail. And while he was in jail, he read the dictionary because that was one of the only things that they had. And he was a little bit troubled by the definitions of white and black. Um, and we'll look at black as you can see, um, black doesn't necessarily have positive connotations. Black implies the black sheep doesn't fit in right? Black is something that's soiled, whereas white is something that's pure. And Malcolm X was really angered by that. And he noticed inherent in our very language is stuff that oppresses his people. And he decided to speak up about this and tell his community about this. And he actually started a resistance movement that was really successful. And if Martin Luther King's movement and Malcolm X's movement didn't work together, they might not have had as much success as they did because they took very different approaches and that covered all of their bases. Um, but as we can see, black doesn't always have positive associations. Can you guys think of any examples of the term black that you'll hear in just regular conversation? Well, let's go to the, the next, uh, I don't know, Prezi slide. So I wanna take a step back from black and white and talk about good and bad. I have a quote here from Friedrich Nietzsche who was a philosopher. Um, I'm gonna try to move your guys' faces so that I can show you the really complicated name that you'll see throughout college. Nietzsche right here, he's a philosopher. You'll hear about uh, quite a bit. They love quoting him at Evergreen. So I'm sure you're gonna hear about Nietzsche a lot at your time at Evergreen. Um, but Nietzsche is a, a philosopher out of Germany in the 19th century. And he did a book called The Genealogy of Morals where he looked into the history of where we get the ideas of good and bad. 
and he actually the whole book is full of information that's really useful but he said the, it was the good themselves the noble the mighty high placed and high minded who decreed themselves and their actions to be good i.e belonging to the highest rank in contradistinction to all that was base low-minded and plebeian do you all know what plebeian means thumbs up or thumbs down thumbs up Okay, thumbs up. So um, I can't see Ge Jeffrey's thumb, but I'm just going to remind you plebeian means that you're not bourgeois. It's the opposite of bourgeois. So that's part of that dichotomy. Bourgeois and proletariat or bourgeois and plebeian. The bourgeois are the rich, the bourgeoisie, and the plebeian are the poor. Um, and they were talked about in uh, the Communist Manifesto and other books by Marx. Um, and so what Nietzsche is referring to here is that it was the people who were the rich, the people who had nobility in our society, the people who had power, who got to decide what was good. And as you can see, um, I included an image for when I looked up the, I used to just do the entire lecture online. I would look up things online and just show people live action what I was finding. Um, but it's just a lot easier to do this. So I looked up the origin of the word good. And in English, it arrived into the English language before 900 AD, and actually the same with the word evil, um, but I didn't include the information for evil in this slideshow. Um, but it likely came from Old English good, which was related to the Dutch good, or the German gut, which is also related to the word goat, which is God. So gut in German is good, and goat in German is God, and English is a Germanic language. And so both um, good, both good and evil arrived in English around the same time. They arrived together and they're very linked with religion. They're relinked to, they're linked to God. Um, and as you can see, there are other things that are associated with the word good um, as Nietzsche goes into, there are lots of different societies that had different specific definitions, but when it entered our language, it was very linked with religion and Christian religion at that. And so to be, um, to be a good Christian might mean that you're a good person according to our language. Um, and if you're not Christian, then how do you fit into that, right? Um, so to talk about another word, the opposite of good or bad, um, which is normally how we will refer to that today, um, another quote by Nietzsche, many of the words and roots denominating good still carry overtones of the meanings according to which the nobility regarded themselves as possessing the highest moral rank, describing themselves simply in terms of their superior power as rulers or in terms of the visible signs of their superiority as the rich, the possessors. And so um, that might be visible signs of their superiority being their dress, their high class dress, um, but it also might be their skin color. And that's actually what he goes on to talk about in the book almost immediately after that, which I wasn't able to fit onto this slideshow for the context of the uh, workshop I was given. Um, but he does talk about um, skin color as being associated with what people originally defined as good and bad. And what I did was I looked up the origin of the word bad um, on the internet. And as we can see, it arrived in the English language at a very different time than the word good. Um, let's see. Oops, I don't know what's going on. So, uh, Sebastian, would you mind uh, monitor the chat? Um, so, the word bad arrived into the English language, into Middle English, between 1250 and 1300. That's a very specific 50 year period. <laughs> <laughs> and it entered um, because it was associated with the words bedel, which meant hermaphrodite, and bedling, which meant womanly man or womanish man. Um, and so what does it mean when we say that something's bad? Given its original connotations, if something's bad, then it's womanly or it's opposite of man. And that might be where some of the the connotations with straight and gay come from, because we do think about that as a dichotomy. But as, as you can see with the LGBTQ rainbow, they think of that more as a spectrum. People who are like on that spectrum think of it more as a spectrum, meaning that you can be anywhere in between straight and gay, right? Um, and a lot of men don't even acknowledge if one another are bisexual. A lot of men, if there's a, a man who is bisexual, men will assume that he is gay. And it could come back to this 
idea of a dichotomy of good and bad and how associated that is with gender um, because people do tend to think of gay men as a little bit more womanly than straight men and that's just an association that exists in our society that isn't necessarily true <laughs> and so um, I actually my friend Jose like six foot five guy like 350 pounds really big gayest man you'll ever meet but because he's big he's never experienced a lot of the um the harassment that like his boyfriend had experienced right um and that's because he's a big intimidating guy and people don't feel like they have that kind of a power over him right um whereas his boyfriend maybe carries himself in a more feminine way um and so you have to think about what are we doing when we say something is good or bad um, and just to complicate this further, I think this is going to, oh man, I'm on Zoom. Uh, it went out. Let's see, where are we? I think it started over because it froze. So let me go through this really quick. This is Prezi, by the way, if you guys ever want to um, use a really cool presentation tool that takes you through this type of stuff, Prezi is pretty nice. This is what I wanted to show you. Um, so this is what really concerned um, Malcolm X and has concerned a lot of other people are um, definitions to these dichotomous words or these binary terms. As you can see, black, um, you have the generic definitions, lacking hue and brightness, absorbing light without reflecting, characterized by absence of light, enveloped in darkness. Um, then we start getting into more politicized terms pertaining or belonging to any very pop various populations i think i said that wrong. to any of the various populations characterized by dark skin pigmentation especially the dark-skinned peoples of africa oceania and australia um, or b for that same definition african americans and then we start getting into really negative definitions soiled or stained with dirt gloomy pessimistic dismal deliberately harmful, inexcusable, boding ill, sudden, sullen or hostile, threatening. And all of these come with the definition of black. And if you're a person who identifies as black and people around you in the very language that they use have these so associations with your race, then that might impact their bias. That might impact their implicit bias in the way that they treat you. And it may not even be intentional. It could just be very subtle as a result of growing up with values that are imposed upon us based on our language. Um, and then as you can see, in contradistinction to black, we have white. Um, and we have a few definitions that are, you know, free from color, you know, the color of snow or milk, light or pallid, lustrous, pale gray, um, silver. And then we start getting into more politicized terms. So we have um, being a member of the group or race characterized by light skin pigmentation, being related to white people or their culture. Um, from the former stereotypical association of good character with Northern European descent, <laughs> marked by upright fairness, that's mighty white of you, free from spot, spot or blemish, free from moral impurity, um, unmarked by, uh, I guess unmarked by writing or printing is probably just a blank sheet of paper, so I guess uh, that, that changes things, but purity, that's another definition that's in there, not intended to cause harm, um, and so you have a lot of these really positive associations with the term white, and so if you're thinking about black with all those negative terms and you're thinking about white with all those positive terms associated, then when you apply those colors to people, then you probably are associating black with negative with bad and you're probably associating white with positive with good. And that's part of the problem that we're, we're living with today is that black by the very definition is hostile and threatening, whereas white can not possibly be hostile because it's not intended to cause harm as by the de very definition that we can find. And uh, I think this is from dictionary.com actually. Um, any questions so far? All right, so why should we avoid binaries? because it creates that dichotomy of us versus them. And I posted up a picture of their East versus West, because a lot of the times we'll see that with like gang wars and stuff like that, the East side versus the West side, right? It's us versus them. But really what's the difference between two different groups of people in LA to the rest of us, they're just people from Los Angeles, right? <laughs> or like people from Tacoma, right? But they're fighting one another because they've created that us versus them, which actually created a huge, um, uh, divided rhetoric 
which made people think of the others as enemies or think of other people as others, right? Um, and actually, Philip, who is working with the younger kids, the regular UBSLI program, he did a bunch of study abroad work in Rwanda in Africa, and he was doing anti-genocide work because in, I think it was 1993 or 94, there was a huge genocide in Rwanda, and it was the Hassas versus I, I can't actually remember. I don't want to, I don't, I don't think I'm getting the tribes right on that. So I don't want to actually give you guys the wrong information, but it was two different peoples who were actually the same people before the government convinced them that they were different people from one another. And actually it's illegal now is what, what he's told me is it's illegal now for them to use divisive rhetoric in that country. You can be thrown in jail because of the extent to which um, people went to as a result of that division, they were killing one another. They were really killing one another. And we're in a dangerous place in our country right now because things are really divided. And outside this country, people only see Americans. But inside this country, it's North versus South, East versus West, or rather coastal versus uh, um, Midwest, right? And so there's a lot of false divisions. And um, it's because we're seeing everyone as either with us or against us. And that's not really the situation. Most likely people ha believe in gray areas, but with the way that the media is portraying people, we have people on one side holding guns, threatening to hurt pro protesters. And then we have protesters who are looting and stuff. And so it's really hard to see this as a black and white issue where we can see a lot of gray areas where maybe um, even if you're on the side of the protesters, you don't agree with everything that they're doing. And even if you're on the side of the people who are against the protesters, maybe you don't agree with everything that they're doing either. And this whole Republican versus Democrat thing has actually put us in a really dangerous place in our country where we forgot that there are other parties <laughs> that kind of align with both of those, but aren't exactly the same, right? Um, and actually that's what our founding fathers warned us that we do not want to become a two-party country because then we're going to be forced to um, compromise. So that's why we should avoid binary terms. And this is another reason why. And I think that this is something that Hannah was trying to talk about yesterday in the workshop that you guys went to. Um, but it becomes really reductionist. You start thinking about people in, in terms of whether or not they agree with you. So just thinking about what, what do we think about with racist people? You guys were giving examples. What's a racist, right? Well, you could have easily jumped out of examples of racist people and gone into, well, racists are bad. Racists are ignorant. They're bigoted. They're prejudiced. They're mean-spirited. A lot of the times they're older. They're from the South, right? And that also creates a dichotomy. So if they're ignorant, the opposite of that is educated. And so those people must not be racist, which means that they're good. They're educated, they're progressive, they're open-minded, they're well-intended, and a lot of the times they're younger if they're not racist, right? But let me tell you, as somebody who works at Evergreen, the if you ask them the least racist school, we actually recently in 2017 got in big trouble because one of our professors was being a little bit racist, right? And he didn't intend to be racist. He didn't realize that the emails that he was sending out to the entire campus, he didn't realize that the rhetoric that he was spouting at the college was very divisive and he didn't realize how much it was hurting another community and that community reacted. And so that ended up creating a really bad situation when he could have just said what he really meant to say. So if I were to say that racists are bad, why don't I instead say racists do not help people of color? Because that's a little bit more of an accurate situation, right? Um, and actually, if I were to call somebody a racist, then can't they just be okay with that and just keep going on being racist, right? Like, if you're okay with being bad, then... You know, what difference does it make if people call you bad? And we're kind of in a place like that where people are calling each other names and they're meaning things by those names, but we're not having serious conversations about it. And so this is why I wanted to look into this. As you can see this image, this actually is an image of, um, I'm wanting to say the Mexica actually, um, but it could easily be um, the Maya or people from um, southern Mexico or Guatemala instead of central Mexico because a lot of those people also practiced sacrifice and cannibalism. Um, but I saw an image like this when I was in college and I was asked to look into my own heritage. And when I looked into my Mexican heritage, I didn't know that much. I'm an affair baby. 
And so I didn't know that much about my dad. My mom's white and I wasn't that interested in looking into my white. My mom's German. I don't want to look into the, the German side of my, my family because the Germans obviously have a very negative association, right? Um, and so I wanted to look into the side of my family I didn't know that much about. I was ready to start exploring that. And I, I wanted to explore what it meant to be Mexican, but I didn't want to explore what it meant to be Spanish. I knew too much about the Spaniards. I wanted to know what it was like to be Mexican. And then I came across images like this and I'm like, oh shit, my people are really bad. My people are bad people. What do I, what do I do? How can I be proud of this? And then I started, as I took more classes, I said, I started reading more, I started reading more philosophy. I realized that these people actually didn't use the terms good and bad. That's not who they were. Um, they didn't dichotomize their value system like that. In fact, they lived in harmony with death and they saw it if, if they didn't give hearts to Itzilopochtli that they actually could be causing death for their entire community and maybe even the entire land, right? Um, and so their culture was very different. It's very different from our own, but it's difficult not to look at their culture without the lens of our own society and without the lens of our own values, without the lens of our own language. Because even by the very nature of translating from Nawal, which was the indigenous language, or Mayan, which is the indigenous language of uh, the peoples of Guatemala, there's lots of different names for the uh, Mayan dialects, including Mam and Kanjobal. Um, but in those languages, those terms don't necessarily exist in the same way. Um, and so how do we translate from that language into Spanish, which does have those values actually, very deeply ingrained values to the point where the sun and the moon are male and female, the day and the night are male and female, <laughs> water and fire I think are, are male and female. No, they're both male, aren't they? Huh. It's depending when you use the water, but but water can be both. And, oh, okay. And el fuego, it's definitely um, male. Yeah, yeah. So we have terms that, that don't exist in the same way in Spanish as they do in the Nawal or in the Mayan uh, dialects. And then further, they are translated into English, which we've already covered is very dichotomous, right? We, I mean, it's to the point where we're actually having arguments in, in meetings about proper pronouns to use because we only have two in English. And actually even German, the language that English comes from has a neutral term for children that is not gendered. Um, and so our, our language is very valued on binary terms. And so I thought to myself, what would happen if I removed those terms from my vocabulary and then I started exploring my heritage? And that's what I did. And I found that these people are very passionate. These people saw themselves as how we would define as good right? And they saw themselves as very dedicated. And so as you read this book, remove the terms good and bad from your vocabulary, or at least don't value what's going on in the text based off of your understanding of good and bad. Um, because if you do that, then you're probably going to side with Diaz in every single obstacle, or Cortez in every single obstacle. And one thing that we have to keep in mind is that these guys are going through Mexico you know, seeing everything that they're seeing through the lens of Spaniards, and not only as Spaniards, but through the lens of inquisitors who were um, charged with enforcing the tenets of Catholicism, as you guys can remember. So these people saw themselves as doing a very good thing by completely eliminating the culture of the community because they were saving people by doing that. Um, but we now know these days that they, they actually committed a lot of atrocities by doing that. And so I do challenge you as you go through the text to try not to read it with the terms good and bad. Diaz uses those terms good and evil a lot. Um, and they'll call, they don't even use the word natives, they use the word Indians, they use the word savages. And already my ancestors are valued. And um, I don't think they're valued very highly to Cortez or whomever, um, unless they gave them a lot of gold, right? Um, so I challenge you guys to think about that. Um, what, how much time do we have? It's now six, so we have about 30 minutes. Um, normally, I would have you guys take five minutes in a small group to talk about when any of these terms maybe had an oppressive or an adverse impact on you or someone you know. Um, thinking about like what ways did the term express binary values or force you to adhere to those values? What message did the speak speaker actually try to convey? So a really good example, I try to give, get people to stop saying the word good and stop saying the word bad as much as possible and instead say what they actually mean. 
So when I say good dog, when I'm talking to my dog, I'm not meaning that my dog, my dog was godly. I'm not like going back to those original terms. I'm meaning she's an obedient dog. Or if I call my dog bad dog, it means really that she just didn't obey me. You disobedient dog, right? Um, so there's something else I'm really trying to say when I use the terms good and bad. And that doesn't reinforce necessarily the binaries that came with good and bad. Um, how do these binary terms oppress despite people's intentions? So like maybe we don't know that the word bad means womanly, right? Um, and that might be oppressive to the women we're calling bad. And how might these messages be conveyed without relying on these valuations? So what are some examples of terms that you guys have, binary terms that you guys have been exposed to that maybe make, made you feel a little bit limited? Even going back to like good student, bad student, has that applied to any of you? Wait, what? So thinking about uh, those binary terms that we were just talking about, have any of those terms actually oppressed you or had an adverse impact on you or maybe made you feel bad? So like you were just talking about being a, a bad student earlier. Has anybody ever called you a bad student? Yeah. Yeah. And how did that make you feel? Didn't make me feel anything. I already know I am. <laughs> well, according to whom? According to the native ed tutors. All right. Well, if we were to take away the native ed tutors, um, or if we were to even try to define what the native ed tutors meant by saying that you were a bad student, what did they really mean to say? I don't know. You have to ask them that. <laughs> yeah, and I actually don't know what they meant by that either because I me wasn't either. there. Um, but you listed a few things earlier. Maybe oh, you yeah. weren't showing up to class and maybe that's what they're talking about. But maybe you're not showing up to class because you're working for your family or maybe you're teaching younger kids or something like that, right? Um, so what are some other examples and maybe not even uh, the bad student one since we talked about that one a lot. What are some other examples of binary terms that maybe you felt a little bit oppressed by or limited by? That's probably a better way to think about it because oppressed, I mean, oppressive actually has a literal definition and at no point has good or bad ever come to my house and like killed my family or anything. And that's real oppression actually. Um, but thinking about the ways that it's maybe made you feel bad or maybe made you feel really limited. And I, I'll give you actually guys, I'll give you guys a really clear example of the ways that that's impacting me right now is with the Republican and Democrat binary, um, because I don't necessarily align with either one of those perfectly. And it's very, very frustrating for me to have conversations with people who definitely don't want to budge on either side, right? Um, because I, I'm not valuing like Republican is bad and Democrat is good or Democrat is bad and Republican is good. I know what I want. And so I'll, I'll ask for those things directly. And that's when it's been really tough for me because I don't know how much of a choice I have but to vote for one of those parties, right? Um, so what are some other examples that you can think of where maybe you've been a little bit limited by these binaries? I guess like when you're, cause I've been called stupid quite a bit, right? <laughs> so the idea of stupid and smart? Yeah. Yeah, and what did it for mean when bit, someone called you? Oh, go ahead. Uh, for a little bit, it just felt like I wasn't on par with everyone else, but in reality, I really was. It was just a decision. Yeah. And what I was called stupid, too, all yeah. the time. Yeah, I've been called stupid, too. And actually... Oh, I didn't mean that what you mean. <laughs> Remember, Lily, this is being recorded. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to put all my other fingers down. <laughs> it's all right, Lily. I don't think that the middle finger is a bad finger. I think it's just a finger, right? <laughs> but actually, to complicate that a little bit more, how often have we called ourselves stupid? And what did we mean by that whenever we've done that? All the I'm time. I'm guilty. Of that. Yeah, and <laughs> what do I mean by that? I mean that I didn't live up to my own standards of intelligent or I, I just maybe made a mistake and I'm not letting myself make a mistake, right? 
<laughs> Any other examples that you guys can think of? Um, no. No? All right. Well, I think we've got kind of an idea of how these terms work and how they basically function as good and bad, right? Mm -hmm. So here's a couple of scenarios where maybe um, you expect a person to be good or a person to be bad, right? So scenario one, a student asks for your feedback on an essay. Remember, I'm, I, I'm used to teaching this to college students. So um, you guys are going to have to get in the mindset that it's fall of your freshman year. So um, scenario one, a student asks you for feedback on an essay. As she hands it to you, she tells you that her AP English teacher already read it and said that it was good and that she wants a fresh pair of eyes to look at it before she sends it in for a scholarship. When you read it, you notice that it does follow standards for conventional written English, but that is also very difficult to follow the argument in many places. So is that person a good writer or a bad writer? or a good student or a bad student, however we want to look at this. It doesn't really, it's really difficult to say, right? And so scenario two, a student wants to drop out of school or college because he doesn't fit in in any of his classes. He tells you that he wasn't cut out for school and that all of his siblings, his parents have always said that he's the bad one because he's been caught smoking weed and has been in trouble for fighting. So does that mean that the student should drop out of college? Does that mean that the student's a bad student? That just might mean that they have some stuff going on in their life, you know? And so neither one of these can easily be placed in a category of good or bad. In reality, both of these students are just at very different places with their writing. They're at very different places in their classes. So, you know, the person who, you know, got an A plus and everything, maybe she already thinks she's a good writer, but if she receives feedback, she can become an even better writer. What's the opposite of even better, right? Um, and so like, we got to get out of these di dichotomous mindsets because if she already thinks that she's good, maybe she won't be receptive to the feedback that her peers have for her. And same with scenario two, if that student just accepts that they're the bad student, if they just think that they're a bad person, then why shouldn't they drop out of college? What's the point? Well, the point is it's not that simple. So my advice to you is to lead by example. Try to remove the terms good and bad from your vocabulary unless it's unavoid unavoidable. I found that in my practice, I've actually been able to eliminate those terms for the most part. You'll still hear me use them um, because it's difficult. It is in our language and it's deeply ingrained and everyone around me uses these value systems. But I've also noticed that with food, that's the one I really can't escape from because saying something tastes good, I don't know how to say that any other way. <laughs> Right? Or saying something that tastes bad, I guess I could say it's gross, but saying something tastes good, I guess I could say it's delicious or whatever. But you a lot of the times amazing. with food, what was that? You could say amazing. And yeah, something yeah. Bad so, atrocious. yeah, see, even collaborating with you guys, I can think of other terms that I can use, but that's the one that's the hardest for me to escape my habit of saying good and bad is with food. Um, but if we lead by example, if we say what we really mean, then we might be able to get people out of using just this language that divides us and we could help people see that it's a really a more complicated situation it's not black or white um to get back to what we were talking about so aristotle said we are uh we are what we repeatedly do excellence then is not an act but a habit and you notice he did not use the terms good or bad anywhere so if we lead by example then we should be able to influence other people to use the language that they really mean and we might be able to escape uh ways that we're oppressing other people so other ways that we can combat this binary language. Contemporary British poet and philosopher Denise Riley claims names and values are bestowed upon us from the external. And this is in her, books, her book, The Words of Selves. So just to pause for a second, um, I am Mexican, I am white, I am a woman, I am Riva. I have given none of those titles to myself, none of them whatsoever. And I think that what you'll find is that you really don't have control over how you identify. In fact, I, because I'm half white and I'm half Mexican, a lot of people of color do not consider me a person of color. They think that I'm just a white woman. And I don't have a lot of agency in those circles to say, no, I'm, I'm one of you guys. I can't speak Spanish. And I, I'm mostly like really German acting, but <laughs> trust me, I'm one of you guys. <laughs> I couldn't even join Mecha. They chased me out because I didn't speak Spanish. So I couldn't be a real Mexican, right? So I don't have control over these names. Other people are giving me these names, but 
As a mixed race person, I do have the right to identify however I want. And if I keep in mind that what other people say to me is more of a reflection of where they are, then I don't have to let those terms oppress me, right? So in her book, uh, she says names are bestowed um, from the external. So if someone says an insult to me, other people might be inclined to believe that because that's a name that they've given me. And even if I say, no, I'm not, then it doesn't matter. They're, they're gonna put these names on me on their own. And even like you students might even like, man, Reva's scary, Reva's bossy. Like you guys might have some names that you've given to me as well. And I've heard more than a few of you guys say I'm scary. So I didn't ask to be scary. Um, that just happened um, because other people were, you were placing that value on me. Um, but that just shows how we don't have that kind of control over these types of things. We never name ourselves. Rather, we are always named by others. And actually, this is kind of where the inconsistencies with self-identification and gender pronouns come in. So if like, or even like uh, with the gay and straight dichotomy, I'm really glad that you brought that up because often people will use the word gay to describe something that they don't like, um, to describe bad, right? It still kind of comes back to that womanly man uh, definition. And so if a man were to say, I'm not gay, like I have a girlfriend, then does he actually have any power to, to say that? because it really depends on what the other people really think. So if one, sa one person says you're gay and all of the people around that person agree, then that name is put on that person. And actually that's not as much of an issue, um, just broadly speaking. I think that probably Mundo, you've seen that play out in your school quite a bit, but after you get out of those teenager college years, it's more of like a, it's more of a personal, like your family might do it or your personal friends might do it. It's not very common for random people to do that unless it's, you know, my experience as a woman and I'm mistaken. <laughs> hey Reva. Uh-huh. When did gay start becoming negative? Cause wasn't it considered or the word meant actually like happy and joyful for a while? Yeah, so um, there was a point in our history where it was officially declared a, dis a disability. Um, and it, that's kind of, it's a mental illness. It was considered a mental illness up until I think the 80s or 90s. Until very recently, it was considered a mental illness. If you identified as gay, you were not allowed to um, get a job as a school teacher. You weren't allowed to do a lot of different things. Um, and I think the association with bad maybe has a little bit to do with the womanly part. Um, because historically speaking, um, English speaking cultures don't necessarily have good associations with the word gay. Um, but it also used to be used in a very different way um, at one point. And I think that, that that definition maybe fell off a little bit um, after it you know, entered the DSM as a mental illness. And I think that happened in like the 1800s. Like I, I really can't, I don't know the exact history of that, but that actually is a really good question to ask at the workshop tomorrow with Amira, um, who will be talking about pronouns and LGBTQ stuff. And actually that's very, very relevant on college campuses. So um, th that's my guess. I, I haven't done the research for that, um, but that would be something that maybe we can ask them because I know Amira actually has done a lot of research into this subject and they're very knowledgeable about that. So maybe we can talk to them about it. And actually thinking about um, binaries, there's one thing that I don't know if it came up yesterday, but uh, Hannah's name, you'll notice that when she logs into Zoom, it'll say Hannah Simonetti, she, her. And that's because she's identifying her pronouns. And on the very first day, Amr identified his pronouns. And I've kind of gotten out of the habit of identifying my pronouns because one, I don't really have a pronoun preference. And two, um, I work with Shelton people and sometimes it's really off putting to Shelton parents or teachers. If I start talking about pronouns, then they, they don't talk about the things I need to actually talk about. And so I'm very careful about how I have that conversation. Um, but if you work with people who are from other countries all the time, your pronouns are going to get mixed up with you all the time because pronouns work differently in other languages, right? And that's actually where a lot of issues come into the college campuses. Um, people will, and it's not exclusive to Evergreen, it's all over college campuses, they identify their pronouns um, so that people who identify as the pronoun that's different from the one that they were assigned, their uh, assigned sex, um, so that they can tell us how they identify and so that we can be respectful of that. It's 
perfectly respectable to just say, I prefer not to answer. People are okay with that. Um, but people tend to get really defensive about the pronouns because it's something that they're not used to identifying in themselves. They're used to just other proving to other people that they have a pronoun, right? I shave my armpits and my legs because when I was a little kid, a little Mexican kid, I had the hairiest legs and the hairiest, ar I guess not hairiest armpits, I had the hairiest legs, right? So I shaved my legs because I was constantly called a man when I was a kid. I don't want other people bestowing that on me. I want to have some agency in that. So I shave my legs. And so what we're doing nowadays is we're just identifying our pronouns and we're asking people to respect that. And I think it's difficult because people aren't used to that. Um, but to get back to this part, um, talking about Denise Riley, she says that we can regain control over our ability to self-identify by using linguistic tricks like irony and repetition. So for example, um, the word bad, like you listen to that Michael Jackson song, I'm bad, I'm bad, right? And it has a very different association in that song than just like, Michael Jackson, you're bad, which you may, maybe people have also said to him. Um, but being bad didn't necessarily mean bad. It actually kind of meant good, right? It meant awesome or it meant badass. And badass doesn't mean a bad thing, right? Badass is kind of a cool okay. thing. Riva, I uh -huh. have a question. I mean, Lily has a question and she wants to know what um, what is the meaning of by pronoun? Oh, by pronoun. What do you mean by pronoun? Yeah. yeah, so by pronoun, that's a good question because I take for granted that everybody knows. So a pronoun is basically just a really shortened word to replace your name. So like if you are talking, if I'm talking about Riva, my name is Riva Villa. Riva Villa does this, Riva Villa does that. I don't have to say that over and over again. I can say, I do this, I do that. That's a pronoun or give that to me instead of give that to Riva. Saying me is a pronoun, but also he, she, it, um, I think there are some new terms. Zazer was when I was in college were the um, trans pronouns, but now a lot of trans people are asking for they and them, um, although they may identify as one gender or the other. So a pronoun is the shortened uh, noun that you use to identify the person. So instead of saying Lily asked that question, I could say she asked that question, right? And that's only if you identify as she, her, right? So we have those conversations. Um, it could be that I identify as he, him, but by looking at me, you guys can't really tell. Um, and so doesn't it help if I tell you that? <laughs> Isn't it respectful of me to tell you how, what to call me, right? Um, and so it's the same idea. Refer to somebody using their preferred pronouns and give people an idea of how they can refer to you. And if you prefer not to answer, don't be offended if people refer to you by some kind of default pronoun. The whole point of the pronoun conversation is to avoid one pronoun in particular. Can you guess which one that is? No? It's the pronoun it. Because there's nothing that dehumanizes somebody more than calling them it. And if you're not either he or she, a lot of people will jump to the pronoun it, right? And that's the pronoun that dehumanizes people. That's the pronoun that makes people feel like an object or a live, you know, an animal, you know. So that that's the one that people are avoiding. So that's a very good question, Lily. Um, so these linguistic tricks that we're talking about, I mentioned the word bad, but there's one word in particular where an entire community of people has had a lot of luck changing the definition of a word from a really negative association to a positive association. And they've done it in such a way that I can't even say what word it is. And so I'm guessing that you guys can guess what letter that word begins with, right? Yeah. It's the N-word, and the N-word was kind of taken back by the African-American community. I believe it has, uh, I believe the Black Panthers were using it very ironically. Um, I don't know if it has roots before that being used ironically, but I know within the community, um, they use it with one another very frequently. Um, and so Black people calling each other the N-word back and forth, they're using it not only in a positive way, but they're using it over and over and over again. And they've also associated white use of it or any non-black use of the term as extremely negative. And so by using those tricks, irony, using the word ironically with one another and using it over and over and over again, they've redefined the word for us. And they've actually been very successful at it to the point where I can't tell you what the word is without possibly getting in trouble for it. And that's a victory. That's a win, right? I want to be able to do that with some terms that are associated with my people, but uh, that's 
maybe a little bit far off. But another word that's starting to have a bit of a change to it is the word bitch, right? Like, hey, bitch, how's it going? You know, like, it's, we, we're starting to have a different term for that. And even uh, some women are using the word slut. And we're starting to push back on the whole slut shaming and like, hey, slut, how are you doing? And it's not meaning a bad thing. They're doing the same type of work using the term ironically to refer to one another and using it over and over and over again. The problem is that we're not all in agreement about that. <laughs> and so how can we be successful if we're not all in agreement? We're just going to fight each other. And that's, you know, language is complicated like that. It's very important to a lot of us. Um, so we don't have a ton of time left. But I actually, this isn't an assignment. This is something we gave you guys a bunch of little notebooks that I'm hoping you guys can uh, do some journaling in. So I would like for you guys to think about doing this. I want you to think about writing a prompt or writing a poem, four to six lines, thinking about the word that is, has adversely impacted your life, one of these binary terms, and write a four to six line poem without using it at all or using it ironically, composing a four to six line uh, poem, using the words on that first document that we created, picking a, a team of those, and um, using the word ironically to where you change the definition within that poem. And I also challenge you guys to um, use repetition. So write a, write a poem um, expressing when one of these terms adversely impacted your life, but use the word a lot. Use it at least twice per line. I think what you'll find is that the words have a very different impact. Um, I did a, this poetry exercise at one point where um, we had to introduce new words and we were looking for really interesting words. And one word that uh, somebody introduced into the conversation was the word ballcock, which it sounds really bad, but it, it's the ball in the back of the toilet um, that floats when you flush the toilet. That's a ballcock. Um, but if you use, he, what he did was he wrote in a, a poem, the entire poem was ballcock, 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 ballcock. Doesn't that change the definition of that word a little bit? Makes it maybe inappropriate at one minute and then it changes it back to something innocent or maybe just something musical at the end of that. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can play with language and get it to do different things. So that's the presentation. Um, I wanted to also talk about the text a little bit. Um, I know that possibly you guys didn't have a lot of time this time. Definitely you didn't have a lot of time to read the text. And I was asking you guys to read pages 15 to 95, which is a lot. Um, so what did we manage to uh, get through? I'm going to stop share. What do you mean? So how much of the book did you manage to either listen to or read? That's your one page. One page. All right. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm probably going to start from uh, Ramundo. You read page up through the second chapter, right? I think I read the page 25. Yeah, I read the first chapter or something like that. OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to create some videos for you guys. There'll be simple Zoom videos. They're not going to be nice like my uh, my Edgar Allan Poe video where I had Tony do all the music and everything. I won't, I won't make them super nice or anything. Uh, we'll do some English language videos so that you guys have access to an audio uh, file of these texts. Um, but in the meantime, um, I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with chapter two. Um, so if you haven't gotten up to chapter two, I would advise you do some you know, fast reading techniques where you read the first line of a paragraph and the last line of the paragraph. Um, and of course, the first paragraph of the chapter and the last paragraph of the chapter. Usually those are your, your thesis statement and the recap of your thesis statement with the first and last, and then the paragraphs between. So you can get an idea of what the text is about. Another thing to keep in mind is books aren't gonna change. If you already go through a section, you have an idea of what that's saying then move on to the next section. You don't have to read every single word to understand the text. Um, and so try to try to speed read as much as possible. There are also resources online that as your instructor, I shouldn't be telling you guys to utilize, um, but there are things like Spark Notes and Cliff Notes, which are what a lot of college students use before they go to seminar to talk about books if they didn't read through the chapters all the way. Um, but if you speak Spanish, 
uh, like Jeffrey, then you can listen to the text and actually the entire book is on the link that I sent you. So if you just click the first one, the playlist is what's linked to that and you can just listen to it all the way through. <laughs> it's like a music video watching you, Lily. <laughs> I can't say still, I'm sorry guys. <laughs> so what I was hoping that we could talk about this week is just the context for um, the book. So was there anything that you guys read so far that was unexpected? Like anything that was weird about the way the Spaniards were or um, have we come across any of the indigenous people yet? Um, what are some of the things that we noticed and what did we think about Spain before we started reading the book? What did we think about Mexico um, or even Cuba before we started reading the book? Oh, I already forgot what I read. Yeah, it's kind of hard sometimes, especially if you're an auditory person to retain stuff. What were you going to say, Mundo? I was going to say I'm surprised that from what I read, and I think this is what happened, but that they didn't want to enslave some people because they thought that they were supposed to be free people by God. Can you hear that? that? Oh. Why the fuck are they lying? Oh, this is a video. <laughs> <laughs> you may want to mute yourself before you exclaim like that. <laughs> Thanks, Sebastian. <laughs> so, what were you saying, Mundo? Oh, I was surprised that during the first voyage, before they went on the voyage, they didn't really want to enslave some people because they said they were free people and that was their right given by God. Yeah. Yeah, and that kind of goes back to the uh, conversation that we had on the first day talking about, you know, the Spanish Inquisition and the slave trade and stuff like that. I don't know if you made it to that one. Did you get the chance to watch the video of that one, Mundo? Okay. Do you have the links for it? Okay, cool. So if you ever get around to it, try to watch that video. That can be really helpful for providing some context for that. But yeah, actually, the uh, Vatican didn't necessarily approve taking slaves of the natives. Um, and yet they were okay with taking slaves of the Africans. So that's one thing to, to think about is how did, how did the Vatican see the different people? Um, because they had a lot of control due to the Inquisition. So anything else that, that you guys maybe expected of, of Mexico or of Spain? Yeah, I know things are still, uh, it's still kind of the beginning. So it's really hard to tell. Um, one thing that I had questions about when I read the first couple of chapters were who were the people that they came across um, in the first couple of chapters, the first couple of voyages, because they did come across some people and were slaughtered by some people. Um, and so who were, who were those people? <laughs> um, and so I don't know if there's a footnote. I can't remember if anything in there talks about it. But uh, I'm not exactly sure who those people were, but they were not the Mexica that they came across to begin with who, you know, butchered a lot of them. And there's going to be a lot of Spaniard butchering in this. <laughs> there will be other butchering too, um, but there's going to be a lot of fighting in this book. This is written by a conquistador. So another thing that surprised me too is that uh, the author of this book was, I think he was the first governor of Guatemala, if not the first, one of the earliest governors of Guatemala. Um, and I think they even made another captain who was um, Sandoval. I think that's the one that they made the governor of Honduras. Um, but I think what you'll find is there are different characters in here who are associated with contemporary places that we know. And so, especially Jeffrey, you've traveled throughout um, certain places in Central America. You might recognize some of those names. I had a conversation with Brian about um, the first couple of chapters when I first started reading it. And I was telling him some of the places like Campeche, um, where's the other one, Sempuala, um, like all these different places. He's like, oh yeah, I've heard of that place. I've heard of Tlaxcala. I've heard of uh, Lake Tixcoco. I've heard of uh, Campeche, which was the first point where they actually, I think, uh, slaughtered people. Um, but yeah. What we're going to do each week is Sebastian and I will come up with some questions. The questions that we were going to talk about today are just to try to contextualize, see what we know about the Spaniards and see if there's anything that surprised us. Um, like I mentioned to you earlier, Mundo, and I'll repeat for Jeffrey and Lily, um, 
we are going to come up with questions the first couple week for, weeks for you guys to discuss. Um, but after that, we're going to kind of leave it to you guys to just respond naturally to the text based off of things that you noticed, things that surprised you, um, things that you managed to read through. Um, and, you know, if it's a short section, talk about that section. Um, but we're going to start getting into the practice of how Evergreen asks you to enter seminar, which isn't necessarily with anything prepared. They don't always have questions for you. Sometimes they're like, well, what do you guys think of the book? And then a lot of the times people are very opinionated at Evergreen, so they'll have opinions about the book. But first year, usually it's just sitting around listening to nothing for a while because people are afraid to talk. So if you get this practice in now, if we start talking, and especially if you guys get in the practice of not just answering our questions, then it's going to make it's going to make seminar a lot easier for you guys and being um and i don't know necessarily how you identify mundo because i can't remember what your application said um but your last name is spanish and i know as somebody with a spanish last name people kind of expect me to know this story even though they don't know anything about me they're kind of placing that on me and that's something that uh Jeffrey, you may encounter this because you speak Spanish. I don't know how often you've come across people expecting you to know stories about Mexico, Sebastian, but a lot of people, if you have a Spanish last name, they, they'll associate you with Mexico and they'll assume that you know Mexican history. They'll assume that you know the story, right? They always assume I speak Spanish, but I don't. Yeah, you know the sad thing is no one assumes I speak Spanish. <laughs> I think people figured it out. <laughs> But like my old boss, Felix, he he was black and Filipino. Everyone thought he spoke Spanish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but Philly, it, Philly was a clear example of that. Well, I, I mean, I thought at first sight that he was, you know, Spanish speaker. Yeah. He was like, no, I'm actually Filipino. And I thought I was at some point then Latino. So I jumped, yeah. like, probably identifies Latino. He was yeah. like, oh, I'm black and Filipino. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. The conquistadors, they got around. <laughs> they conquered a lot of places. <laughs> The Spaniards really took over, and actually the Philippines is another place where you'll see regularly uh, Spanish last names and stuff. Uh, Felix's middle name is Pedro. <laughs> so yeah, he's actually, his family is associated with, I think, uh, St. Martin, um, or maybe other places in the Caribbean. I can't remember. I think it's St. Martin. But uh, even you, Lily, uh, you've got the Salish um, history, you've got the Salish associations, and people are going to assume that you know a little bit about people taking over the area. They're going to assume that you know um, about the Medicine Creek Treaty, right? Um, and those are assumptions that people are placing on you. You don't necessarily have to know those things. But I wanted to introduce this to you guys because um, thinking about what people expected me to know in college, um, this is something that people expected me to know. And I didn't even have a Spanish last name. I had my mom's last name, Roller. So if you're friends with me on Facebook, that's where I got that. That's my mom's name, um, which is super German name. But people still expected me to understand the story. They still thought that I knew it. And one thing that you'll also find is that people will tell you versions of this story that aren't necessarily the versions that you're going to read in this book. They're going to tell you things that they either learned from other sources or they will tell you things that they just heard. Um, even, oh God, why can't I remember his name right now? There's a comedian, um, John Leguizamo. He's an actor and a comedian. He actually does the voice for Sid the Sloth in Ice Age. He does an entire stand-up set talking about this story and actually has a very biased perception of uh, Moctezuma, who, when I read this, I actually thought that he was a really strategic leader. He was a really... Um, he thought about his people first, whereas um, a lot of Mexicans, we really love Guautemoc. He's the guy on the Bohemia beer label. Like Guautemoc is the last Aztec leader. He's the last one. And so we see him as a hero, but actually he put his people in a lot of danger as you're going to read um, as you finish this book, right? And so maybe he didn't necessarily make the best decisions for his people by constantly fighting. And people will present this very black and white story to you guys, assuming that um, you're gonna not only know this story already, but assuming that you're going to believe that what they portray to you is true. And so th that's part of the reason I wanted you guys to read this book. And another reason is because this book actually has a lot of characteristics that are similar to the Iliad. And that was another thing I was considering teaching you guys is the ancient Greek, some of the ancient Greek stories, because that's definitely going to be relevant in college. Um, but 
you're going to have a lot more access to that in college than you are to um, stories like this. You may not ever take a class that has you talk about this stuff, but you're going to have lots of classes where you're going to have opportunities to talk about the Greeks. And so I wanted to give you guys a different route to get some of the same um, practice. So hopefully this is helpful for you. Um, I, like I said, I'm gonna try to do some videos. I'll do maybe one video a day if I can manage to create the time for it where I'm reading part of the text to you guys in English since the Spanish speakers have that entire collection of videos that they can listen to. I wanna make it a little bit easier for you guys to access the text as well. So do we have any questions? <laughs> All right. So um, what we'll do is let me look and make sure I know what you guys have due um, on Monday so that I can remind you. And um, Sebastian's probably going to be reaching out to all of you to schedule one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings if you guys don't turn in your work so that we can make sure that you can be successful in this class. Um, it's really a lot of professors are trying to make it easier for people to be successful. So we want to do the same thing for you guys. If you have a hard time, then let us know. Um, so draft number two is I put on the can on the uh, uh, syllabus that it's due on Canvas, but I don't know if you guys have had a chance to activate your uh, Canvas accounts, your Evergreen accounts. Have you? You haven't received an email about it? No, I haven't. Okay, so um, we'll just go ahead and I'll have you share that with me as soon as you're ready. So you should have already shared it with Sebastian and um, I think Lily, you shared it with Lonnie, right? Yeah. Okay, so you should have already shared it with somebody. The next step is to make the revisions that they suggest or if you're writing it together, then have them just look at it one more time. Um, and then once you make those changes, send it to me, okay? And that's going to be due by midnight tomorrow. And that's just the changes. So you should already have the essay written. If you don't, then you're a little bit behind. But Sebastian can work one on one with you and help you get that done. And so what I'll do is I'll provide some feedback. And um, that way you guys have the whole weekend to work on those changes. So if you make the changes tonight that they suggested, give that to me by midnight tomorrow. Um, then I'll make some suggestions as well um, based off of your final draft and I'll give you a mock grade for that, okay? Um, so you should have the rubric, it tells you how much style is worth, it tells you organization, focus, all that stuff. Um, I want you guys to see that because that's how I was trained to grade at a traditional college um, and that might be how you're graded at Evergreen, um, but I want you to see how your essay would do in a regular English 102 class so that you know where you need to improve. And keep in mind that if I give you feedback that doesn't mean you're a bad writer, actually I give a lot more feedback to people that I'm whose writing I'm engaged with because I get excited and I have a lot to say about it. And so um, getting a lot of feedback. In fact, the worst feedback you can get from me is I refuse to read this because you clearly got it online. <laughs> so um, don't cheat. Don't don't plagiarize because I can always figure that out. We have lots of little secret tricks and there are lots of little online uh, tools that we can use. So don't do that. It's actually, they don't even write very good essays. I marked up those essays before I realized that they had been stolen. So just be aware me giving you guys feedback doesn't necessarily mean your essay is bad. The only time it's bad is when it's not yours. <laughs> okay. And uh, I'm going to give you guys feedback to correct so you guys can see what a final draft would look like or what would need to be corrected for a final draft. Um, and then when you turn in the final draft, you're just going to get a grade back with uh, points on it. Okay. Do you have questions about that? Do I just share it to you after I make revisions? Yes, that's what I meant to say. I'm sorry if I forgot to actually say that. I haven't even started. All right. Where were you working with uh, Lonnie last night? Um, no, I got home at like 11 last night. Okay. Well, do you want to schedule a time to work with Sebastian? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, I'm just going to stop recording unless you guys have any more questions that are relevant to either the lecture, what we're going to do for seminar, or anything that's due um, by the end of the day tomorrow. Wait, there's something to do tomorrow? Just your revisions for the essay that you haven't written. 
<laughs> so what Sebastian's actually really good at doing is he's really good at giving feedback along the way. There's a form that he's going to fill out that'll let you know how he reads it. And that's probably going to be really helpful for you because that's the point. We need to make sure that our readers understand what we're writing, okay? And so he's going to give you some feedback as you're going through it. And if you make those changes as you guys are going through that together, then you don't have to, you don't have to do anything separate. You can just share it with me, okay? So I'm going to stop recording. Um, let me find that record button. <laughs>